Hello, welcome to another virtual program with Maine Historical Society. It is July 22nd, 2021, and this is 19th century Black politics in Maine, historical research and legacies, a panel discussion. And joining us uh, for this program, our panelists, uh, Pamela Cummings, the president of the Committee to Restore the Abyssinian Meeting House. Mary Freeman, uh, who joins us from the University of Maine. Bob Green, a writer, journalist, a historian, teacher, independent scholar, genealogist. And Van Goss, uh, who joins us from Franklin and Marshall University. Thank you so much, uh, panelists, for being with us for this program. Thank you. Thank you. It's our uh, pleasure. And I'm going to, at this point, uh, turn it over to Van to officially start the panel and the discussion for us. Nice. Shall I start? OK. Yeah, go right ahead. Well, I'm, I'm extremely honored to be here with all of you Mainers. Um, the Gosses actually were Mainers for a long time, but all of that connection was lost somewhere in the early 20th century when my grandmother left Maine never to return. But I actually do feel a connection there. Um, so I, I've written a book called The First Reconstruction, Black Politics in America from the Revolution to the Civil War. And that book has an entire chapter on Maine, especially Portland. Um, and the argument in my book is that Black men, because politics, and I'm talking about traditional politics, parties, voting, elections, patronage, all of that, um, was with the exception of New Jersey for about 30 years, women were excluded from traditional politics. They did vote in New Jersey for a substantial period of time, but that's not what we're talking about today. In fact, even black women voted in New Jersey from 1776 to 1807 if they were not enslaved and they were independent. But I'm, I wanna talk about New England and Maine. Um, the reason I wrote this book is that uh, without, without really knowing what I was doing, I discovered a much, much larger history of black men's participation in the American political system than anyone had ever written about. There were a few good books that I relied on, but mostly the assumption had been, even from leading historians, that black men were effectively excluded and so few of them could vote that it wasn't worth studying. And to put it simply, my book challenges that completely. I say that there were enough of them. They did vote. They were politically influential. And people knew about this. Uh, it was widely discussed. In the slave states, it was described as an abomination and a challenge to the very existence of the racial white supremacist order that the slave states embodied. So they paid a great deal of attention. Wait a minute. Let me just get right down to it. When the National Republican Party in 1832 in Portland, the National Republican Party was the predecessor to the Whig Party. It was founded around John Quincy Adams and his successful run for the presidency as a New Englander in 1828. He was the second Northerner to be elected president. His father had been president and had been deposed by a slaveholder, Thomas Jefferson. So John Quincy Adams formed the National Republican Party loosely, very just to back his candidacy. In 1832, it came together. And in Portland, the leading Maine Federalist, General Samuel Fessenden, opened up the party. And dozens and dozens of Black men walked into their party convention to cheers, cheering Black men. And so that gives you an idea. Now I said that this was well known. Southern newspapers covered that in great detail. Look at those Yankees, look at those national Republicans. They socialized with black men. And it went back and forth in the press with General Fessenden defending and saying, of course we do. We do not pay attention to a man's complexion. If he's a good American, he's welcome in our party. So this was just, this is an early indication of how visible and how significant Black men's participation in politics was in Portland and Maine in general. Let me back up, and I'm not going to tell you the whole story. I'm actually just going to tell a few stories and then hand, hand it over. I will have made, done my part. Um, when Maine was founded in 1819, the most senior figure at the Maine Constitutional Convention was George Thatcher. 
He had represented Maine in Congress for 12 years. And during those 12 years from 1789 to 1801, there was absolutely no question who was the most outspoken defender of black citizenship, of black people as human beings and fellow Americans, than this conservative federalist from, what town is he from? I forget, in Southern Maine. He was, he baited Southerners over and over. He tried to extend the Northwest Ordinance into the Southwest, which would have changed the future of this country if the Southwestern states had had slavery banned them. So here was this man. So he's at the Maine Constitutional Convention and one minor figure, a delegate from Calais, tried to insert white into the suffrage clause of the Maine, the Maine Constitution. And Thatcher basically threw him, you know, made fun of him because Thatcher had enormous prestige. Um, and later on, someone actually said, and I'm gonna quote something here, made someone said, well, actually this delegate over here was, was elected. He, wasn't, he doesn't live in the town that elected him as a delegate. Uh, can we allow him in? And Thatcher said, and remember, this is the most senior figure at the founding of Maine. He'd been a, a, a justice on the Manhattan, Massachusetts Supreme Court for decades. He said, if, if, if a town wants to send a man, it doesn't matter who they, if they want to send a black man, they have every right to send a black man. Not that there was not a black man at the convention, as far as I know. So Maine was founded as an aggressively non-racial place. I'm not trying to say it was a paradise, that there was no racism. I'm not talk, saying that at all. But there was no question that black men were going to vote. And already in the 1820s, they were getting patronage positions in Portland city government. And you can look up these men, James Boas, Manuel, Christopher Manuel. These were well-known men. These were businessmen. Everyone knew who they were. Founders of Abyssinian Baptists. Founders of a lot of other things. So by the 1830s, and I will wrap up on this note, they were in politics. And uh, the thing that most gets my attention, a lot of people, Mary Freeman does really good work on Reuben Ruby. I suspect maybe you folks have heard of Reuben Ruby. Maybe you've heard about him setting up the first professional hack service in Portland, a major business. Maybe you've heard about him taking William Lloyd Garrison around Portland the first time Garrison came up to meet with General Fessenden to found the main anti-slavery society. General Fessenden, who had been a very powerful federalist. What you don't know, I suspect, is that the founding of the Whig party in Maine, the founding of this party, very, the major other major political party in 1834, the founding convention, there are four delegates from Portland. General Fessenden is a delegate and Reuben Ruby is a delegate. So Reuben Ruby wasn't just an abolitionist and a businessman, he was actually a serious party politician. And there's, there's a lot more there, this continues straight through. So I'll leave you with one less, and I admit these are anecdotes. Reuben Ruby's life is quite extraordinary. The culmination of it perhaps is 1860, I think it's 1868 or 1870. He's at Portland City Hall as part of a, a, a grand reception. He's been holding a, a very well paid, $500 was a good patronage position. The Republicans had given him a, a customs house position. This is how you rewarded your friends. You, the federal customs house, these are the good jobs. He's an old man, but he's got a good job there. And plenty of other men were saying, this is not enough. We'd like more than that. But Ruben Ruby's, he's earned this. He's sitting at the, uh, the, mayor, the mayor's, the townhouse, whatever you call it in Portland. And there's a reception to welcome his son who has come back from Texas where his son has been elected a state senator in Texas. That's the continuity of black politics in Maine. And then there's, you know, his other son is what? The Portland police chief, I believe, if I've got that right. So the, the, um, for me, black politics in Portland and in Maine is a story in the 19th century of strength, of resilience and of continuity. They are never pushed down, never disfranchised, never defeated. They are a substantial political force. And indeed, General Fessenden's son, William Fessenden, the great Maine Senator, gets into Congress in 1840, defeating a Democrat. And the Democratic papers all around the country say, it's, and I'm gonna quote them, don't be offended, I'm gonna use the language of the time. It's the abolitionists and the Negroes who defeated our Democratic congressman. And that's in papers throughout the country. So to me, as a would-be Mainer, this is something to be very proud of, the continuity and the force and the effectiveness of Black politics in Maine before the Civil War. That's what I had to say. I'm selling my book.
Thanks. So I think, uh, Pam, we had you up next, if you're ready to, to go ahead. So, so um, I am the president of the uh, Ab Committee to Restore the Abyssinian Meeting House. We are restoring the third oldest African-American um, meeting house in the country. Um, and we're not, I'm not sure that, uh, that you know, everybody here knows exactly what the Abyssinian Meeting House is, um, but it is a building that was erected because uh, five black men uh, Reuben uh, Ruby went to church at, here, right here in the city of Portland, Maine. Um, and they went to church and they were relegated. They weren't allowed to worship on the main floor. And so, as you've just heard, when we're talking about the types of men, black men that, um, that we're talking about, they didn't sit back. They were not rolled all over. These were well-educated um, black men that said, we are no longer, we don't need to be treated this way. We're not gonna be treated this way. And one of the big movements was in, um, I believe it was 1827, uh, the, the churches um, in, in Philadelphia, they, they were all starting to ask and say, demanding, we have what it takes. We can do this. We can, um, we can establish our own um, churches we can go to church and we can sit where we want to sit, how we want to sit. We don't need to have them tell us that we can only sit in the balcony. Um, and they went and they began, they started this church, the Abyssinian Church, which today is known as the Abyssinian Meeting House. Um, it, is, it is in that church that they mobilized, if you will. They um, got together. There were men and women congregants who were very instrumental in the Underground Railroad, because again, you have these people who are um, globally aware because a lot of, um, they have friendships with people from around the country. And um, one of them even went, was in England, which made it the global. They were aware of the global issues at hand. Um, and so, yeah, again, you're hearing this over and over again that these were strong black men, had great paying jobs, tax paying money. They, um, the interest of them and the reason for the Abyssinian Meeting House, um, they had a black school because the goal was to educate. Um, and I know that one of the ministers that came, um, he believed in education and, and his idea was going to be to educate and then educate and go back to Liberia. They really weren't planning to be here, but to go back. Um, so we had this black school here that was formed by these black men. Um, and in the school, uh, it was one or five, there were only five, a handful of schools that were being paid for by taxpayers. And that was one of them, the Abyssinian school. Um, it was located in the basement. They took this, the, these black students um, who, by the way, white people had thought often were degenerates. They didn't know how to behave. They weren't well dressed. They didn't, couldn't learn, couldn't do anything. And these black ministers that came um, to the Abyssinian, to, uh, they said, we can do this. We can teach them who they need to be and what they need to do. And so they began there um, with the school. They took them out of the North School in Portland and brought them to school there. Again, education was um, crucial for these men because they were educated. They were college educated. I, and, and when I say that, I'm talking about the ministers that were the leader of that church. Um, so you had those, uh, the people acting in, in, in those fighting, again, fighting for their freedom, fighting for their rights, knowing full well what they were able to do, what they were able to have, what they had access to, but were being denied. Um, they, they were, as I said, the uh, members, we at the Abyssinian, we are right now on the Network to Freedom, which is one of only um, two sites in the state of Maine recognized by National Park Service as an underground railroad site, um, official, underground railroad site. You have to go through a lot, through a lot of red tape to get 
uh, that title and we wear it very proudly. Uh, we do feel that the, the Abyssinian is the crown jewel of black history here in, in Maine, uh, bricks and mortar, if you will. So we, we love um, the history. We stand strong. I don't want to take up everybody's time. I could go on and on and tell you a lot about um, the, the black men and women. So we don't stop at just the black men. These were uh, black men supported by very strong women, period. And they also helped. They were all part of the anti-slavery society. Garrison did come in and he did, was, he did speak at the Abyssinian meeting house. Ruben Ruby introduced him um, to that. And so they were, again, they became involved in, in, in these greater issues at hand. Um, and they got involved in the anti-slavery society um, being one of them. So I, I don't wanna take up any more time except for to tell you that they were absolutely political men involved in a, the politics of Portland, Maine. Um, there's so much that's been left out of history books um, and 10 minutes isn't enough to, to, to explain it all or to, to go through it. So I'll let somebody else speak and then come back to that. Ruben Ruby uh, was my four time great uncle. His sister was my great, great, great grandmother and the wife of Christopher Christian Manuel, who uh, uh, a barber here in Portland, who uh, is kind of overlooked a lot you know, when we start talking about the political history of, of black folks in, in Maine. Ruben Ruby, if you really want to check his credentials as far as uh, where he where he felt he was in this world at the time, is just take a look at his children. He named his children after abolitionists, mm -hmm. English abolitionists. So there's William Wilberforce Ruby, who by the way was a, a fireman, a very high up in the fire department and and had by the way the number one badge which is in the fire museum here there was george thompson ruby the state senator in texas again george thompson was a british abolitionist and there was an american uh man actually it was uh, two brothers in in new york city that were very instrumental in abolitionist society and Reuben named one of his sons after him, Arthur Tappan Ruby. So he knew, Reuben knew and Reuben traveled. He, he was frequently in New York and Boston and Philadelphia where he participated in the national uh, abolitionist scene. In Portland, we have uh, lovely records at the Maine Historical Society of voting records that uh, from uh, 1890 to about 1910. And I was down at the uh, library, Brown Library yesterday, uh, looking at these. And it's very interesting because they're men, no women are listed. But one of the things that I found interesting on that was that one of the things that they put down for every voter was whether or not they were married and where their wife lived, <laughs> which seems kind of strange for somebody if they're not allowing women to vote. The black folks kind of stand out because in a column under remarks, they did list whether they were colored mm -hmm. or not. So it made it quite easy. For example, uh, and this is how it, it, it went down. Edward Vincent, 30, who lived at 37 Newberry, was a cook on the steamer Tremont. Uh, he was born in Maine on November 1st, 1850. And he had lived in Portland for 17 years. He had voted before this election. So, Apparently, this may have been the first time that 
the voting records were actually put down as far as registering to vote because almost most of them are listed as having voted before this particular time. He was married and uh, he was colored. I found it very interesting because one of the people, the only person that's not listed as colored was Corbin Smith, a barber. Uh, he was born in Virginia in 1850. He had spent the last 25 years in Portland, and this is 18, 1891 that he registered. And what they list them, they don't list them as colored. What they list them as is gentlemen of color, <laughs> which I found quite interesting. I am positive that Reuben Ruby, knowing his political acumen and the way that he, he moved in this in society, was one of the ones he probably voted for Maine becoming a, a state, which I would not be surprised at all. And it was this whole period of time that he, Christopher Manuel, and other Blacks uh, not only started the Abyssinian, which was a congregational um, church, the fourth congregational church mm -hmm. in the city. And, uh, but they were very active in politics left and right. By the way, uh, Horatio Ruby, who is Ruben's youngest son, uh, spoke twice at the state uh, meeting of the Green Party, where he backed back the, uh, the nomination, he gave the a second a nomination for the, uh, the man that became governor. Thank you. Thanks so much to the fellow panelists for your remarks. I'm learning so much from this conversation already. And um, I also thank you to Maine Historical Society and to the McGillicuddy Humanities Center at UMaine for uh, allowing this conversation to happen. Um, so I came to this topic of 19th century Black politics in Maine originally through my research into letter writing in the anti-slavery movement. Uh, so I was looking at how correspondence shaped the organization, social networks, and ideas that were driving antebellum abolitionism. And that kind of gives some context to how in the course of my research, uh, the first time I came across Ruben Ruby, who we've heard a little bit about tonight already, uh, was a letter that he wrote in 1836 to a Boston abolitionist, Amos Phelps. I actually have a picture of the letter, which I will show you. You should be able to see. Uh, I have a transcript here in a second, but I want you to encounter it just as I first saw it uh, when I first pulled it out of the folder at the Boston Public Library. Um, so in this letter, uh, Reuben Ruby wrote to Amos Phelps, who at that time was a colleague of William Lloyd Garrison's and had visited Maine as an anti-slavery lecturer at least twice before. Um, and that's where he met Ruby originally. Um, so when I first saw the letter, first of all, Ruben Ruby's name stood out to me. I was just like, that's such a great name uh, to begin with. And I also noticed Portland at the top here, uh, which stood out to me because I grew up in Maine, not too far from Portland. So I was immediately curious to find out more about this document. And then the physical appearance of the letter is also intriguing because the ink is kind of smudged. You can see some words are smudged and crossed out. Um, and it seemed like maybe the letter had to be written hastily, that there wasn't a lot of time uh, for Ruby to write a clean draft before he sent it out. So here I'm gonna read you the transcript of the letter, which I have on the next image here. So Ruby uh, wrote to Phelps, dear sir, I take the liberty to write to you to request you to go or send to the jail and see a man by the name of Jeremiah Rogers that is put in on pretense of mutiny on board 
their brig and see what can be done for him, if you please. I should not have troubled you if I had known anyone that I could depend on. And if it won't be too much trouble, you would oblige him very much. I send $10 and you will give it to him if you please. And I will be good to the amount of $50 if wanted. Please to write as soon as possible, if you please. Yours, Ruben Ruby. And then in a note at the bottom, uh, Ruby added, please to continue my paper, crossing out another redundant, if you please. So he was saying to Phelps, who was the editor of an anti-slavery newspaper, like keep my script subscription going. And then finally at the very bottom, which you can probably barely see on here, uh, there's a pencil note that Ruby added probably right before he mailed out the letter, court last Monday in October. Um, so from this letter, I've been able to piece together uh, a lot of different things since I first saw it originally. I'm gonna stop sharing uh, the image here now, uh, including some of the basics of Ruben Ruby's life and his activist work, which we've heard a little bit about already, including the founding of the Abyssinian church and the construction of the meeting house. Um, and I've also kind of looked into how Ruby's life story helps to illuminate the experiences of Black Mainers in the 19th century and demonstrates that Black activists were really essential to bringing the cause of abolitionism to the state, another theme we've heard a little bit about already. Mm -hmm. uh, so his contact with men like Phelps also suggests some of the connections of this local story to the national picture of anti-slavery activism and as we've heard from Van about his new book, there's also this important dimension to understanding Ruben Ruby as part of this local and regional network of black partisan politics in the antebellum era. Um, so all of this kind of long story short is that as I've gotten deeper and deeper into researching Ruby's life, I found him to be just a remarkable person. He was an entrepreneur, an activist, a community leader, a family man. Um, and I'm also just astounded with how his life has intersected with so many of the major events and figures of his time, ranging from abolition and the Civil War to Maine statehood, the Missouri crisis, uh, Whigs and Democrats competing in Maine, um, even the California gold rush in 1849, which is more than just a little footnote on his life story. Uh, so it's really exciting to see Van's new book and my fellow panelists also exposing new layers to Maine history and national history by adding this context of how we see Maine's anti-slavery politics, abolitionist activism in Maine and beyond um, and their legacies after the Civil War era as well. Uh, so I'm just gonna add here a couple of little pieces um, to, you know, I guess taking what I see as future directions, jumping off from the places where Van's wonderful new book has left us, uh, as well as the work that Bob and Pam have been doing um, here in Maine. Um, so, you know, we've seen Van has really illuminated this incredible story of the details of Black partisan politics in Maine and Portland specifically, uh, which is unexpected in its routine nature where there's this stable, consistent pattern of Black men able to claim citizenship and suffrage rights in Maine from statehood in 1820 up through the turmoil of the Civil War era. Uh, so Van's providing this important perspective that Maine's Black population, though numerically small, had this degree of concentration as well as advantages um, in Maine's kind of port town economy, uh, seaside, you know, kind of maritime uh, employment that provided the members of that Black community with a degree of political leverage. Um, so that significance is clear when you look at um, not only, you know, the fact that Black men were voting and participating in politics, but able to exert their influence to put anti-slavery issues onto the table in mainstream politics in Maine in a way that just was not possible or was very rare in many other states at the time. And on an individual level, you see this legacy 
with someone like Ruby, where, as has been mentioned already, where he himself had significant standing throughout his life, but also his sons went on to carry on that legacy, including his son, William, who uh, went on to become a state senator in Texas during Reconstruction. So turning just to some of the threads that I myself hope to kind of develop in my own research from this extremely strong basis that my panelists have already established. Um, for one thing, I've learned a lot about Ruben Ruby, but going back to that letter I showed you, I've learned absolutely nothing about Jeremiah Rogers, who's that man who was jailed uh, under pretense of mutiny that Ruby was seeking to help with that letter. And I think this is interesting because perhaps Rogers was another local black man in Portland. Perhaps he was a sailor passing through, uh, perhaps in the most, you know, kind of wildest possibility, he could have even been a, a fugitive slave who was stowing away illegally on a northbound ship that Ruby was then trying to intervene to provide assistance. So far, I don't have an answer. I can't claim to know anything uh, concrete. But I think this letter uh, to me is really fascinating because it shows how Ruby was using his connections to tap into this larger abolitionist network to help a friend in danger. So it kind of shows you how even though Ruby had this really strong uh, political network in Portland, there were some limits to that network in that um, a year before this letter before Ruby wrote this letter in 1835, there was an anti-abolitionist meeting in Portland that galvanized white residents on both sides of the political spectrum, Whigs and Democrats, to come out in vocal opposition to abolition. So it's kind of speculating. I can see Ruby witnessing these kinds of political events in Portland and knowing that he has a fairly secure political position within the kind of established channels there, but also knowing that he can tap into the more radical abolitionist network in Boston uh, to provide assistance in this somewhat urgent and perhaps volatile situation. Um, so basically I see Ruby as someone who's definitely part of this political establishment, but also you know, branching out when he needs to, to take advantage of uh, other means of political activism or leverage uh, that are outside of this world of formal politics and elections and voting um, that Van is really focusing on in his book. Then one more thread that I wanted to pull a little bit is actually building on what Pam was saying about uh, black women in uh, the Abyssinian network and also Bob's work with sort of family history and genealogy. I think the uh, idea of family community networks of activism, especially when it comes to Maine's Black women in this time period is something that um, I'd love to develop further through my own research and in you know seeing other what other people are doing. Um, so when Amos Phelps, the man that Ruby addressed that letter to when he actually visited Portland a couple of years before that letter, he wrote this letter himself to his wife where he commented on a tea party that he attended at Ruben Ruby's house where there were around 20 different people there. And actually William Lloyd Garrison who visited Portland also described a really similar scene um, of these tea parties happening at Reuben Ruby's house where members of the Abyssinian Meeting House congregation were kind of getting together, other prominent uh, black men and women in the Portland community. And I was just struck by how um, the tea party was what stuck out to both of these really prominent abolitionists. And that made me think about how this largely male world of partisan politics and even public activism was intertwined with other forms of activism, whether that be Ruben Ruby's letter, where he's seeking aid from an abolitionist colleague, or kind of the daily actions that are often more obscure in the archives of Black women who are organizing meetings and serving tea to crowds of hungry anti-slavery sympathizers. 
Yeah. Um, so I will end there and I look forward to having some time for discussion from the audience. Uh, and thank you very much again to the panelists and to everybody for coming out on this beautiful evening. Thank you, thank you all. And I would just um, really like to echo what Mary said, just how great and interesting it is to have you all here to really shed some light on the many different layers of Portland history and this topic. Uh, and it's really interesting to just hear the work that you're all doing and the things that you're discovering. I want to give you a chance if you have questions that you'd like to ask of each other um, please feel free. And if you're ready, uh, we're getting questions from the audience as well. All right. So I'll start with an audience question. Someone's asking um, about the, the know nothings and the KKK. Um, how were they able to gain power in a, in a place like in a place like Portland, a place like Maine, how did they gain a foothold or, or such traction in a place where there was uh, such a, a strong Black political presence? <laughs> well, uh, so I, I, I'm just going to jump in and Please. shed some light, and, and, and that would be number one. Um, it doesn't take much to penetrate um, that hate into any system. So though Maine or Portland had a strong political base and these men were very actively involved in the politics of racism and anti-slavery, where there's hate, there's a way. So mm -hmm. It wouldn't take much to, uh, to, to go into that. And, and we, do, we already know um, there were people um, in the churches um, especially like the Abyssinian, uh, where the, the men went to church. Um, and so what you, what you saw there is these people were very divided. And, and when I say that, that, I mean individual within themselves, they were very divided. They knew that slavery was wrong and they wanted to see it ended. But um, did they really want to see, um, they, they were willing to see them free, but were white people really willing to um, see black people in power, black men um, as um, lawyers, black men as politicians, black men at city hall. Were they really so? So were they really ready for that? And that caused self conflict, and they were very divided. And the church as well itself, the the members of the church were very divided um, with that very issue. Go ahead, Van. You're still on mute. Two words in the period we're talking before the Civil War, the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is often dominant in Maine. The Democratic Party is a party of slavery and of northern, northern men with southern principles, like Martin Van Buren. And I mean, the, the anti-slavery, sometimes anti-racist vote is over there with the Whigs and then the Republicans, but they're always under, you know, very strongly attacked. So let me just boil it down. Think of today. Mm. Do I need to talk about Paul LePage? I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Do I need to talk about how closely fought Maine was? Was the second congressional district going to go the way it did? You know, as well as I do, you know better than I do how divided Maine is today, right? So it's the same then. Um, now, what's interesting is at certain points, even Democrats are worrying. So there's a main, a main Democratic governor in about, I think it's 1838. His predecessor, the Whig, had, this was a classic political struggle, had refused to return extradite to the South, some men who had aided fugitives. He'd said, no, we, we don't do that. I, I don't accept the, I won't accept the extradition. A Democrat replaces him, and to make sure he doesn't lose his office, maintains that position. And everyone notices, oh, that main Democrat, he's doing the right thing. So that tells you how politically loaded this is. But it goes back and forth. And once you get to the 1850s, I mean, there's this whole period in the 1850s when Maine's politics become completely about temperance. 
That's the know nothing party or the temperance. Temperance, the main law, everyone in the country knows what the main law is. It was the first attempt to completely ban alcohol. That covers over all the debates about slavery, right, on, right up to the verge of the Civil War, which shows you how much people like to be distracted from something that is going to be really difficult. But once the Republican Party really gets going in the late 1850s, the Democrats, they've got one word in their mouths. It's a six letter word that begins with N. <laughs> they use it all the time. That Ruby, those Republicans, sometimes they say black Republicans, that's the polite version. So anyway, that's, that's you know, there's, a, there's always, but I, I think that Pam made this point. All you need to do, it's very easy to insert racism into politics and whip some people up, especially when they see someone like Ruben Ruby getting a nice patronage position. Mm -hmm. Oh, look what, look what the Republicans are going to do. They're going to they're going to take votes. They're going to take jobs away from white yeah. men. Yeah, yeah. Give them to black men. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Except that you know the, the party names have changed. The politics hasn't. Yeah. And I just add that um, you know one thing that is so great. I was just reading <laughs> sections of Van's book to prepare for this panel, but so everybody should go out and uh, buy a copy. Um, but you know, one thing that I think you know, you paint a really optimistic picture of of black politics in Maine in the antebellum era, but at the same time, there's also this undertone of uh, the people like Ruby who are occupying these positions. They were well aware that there were limits to the power that they had. Oh yeah. And those yeah. limits became even more apparent. You know, Ruby's son, who goes on to become a Reconstruction politician in Texas. You know, he's the target of violence when he's uh, in the South during Reconstruction. And, you know, he's sort of, you know, in a di totally different geographic place, but has a similar, Ruby and his son, I think both have this experience of um, seeing how far their gains can get them within the system as it exists and the limits to that as well. And here's a small anecdote. I just want to say this because I don't want anyone to think that any of us on this panel are promoting some kind of happy fairy story. Everything was so good. Yeah. What, the hell, what the hell happened? Senator yeah. Ruby, Senator Ruby, when he stopped in New York with his new bride, he was Jim Crow in the New York hotels. He couldn't get a hotel. He may have been a senator, a st state senator from a very major state. New York hotels, well, we don't care. We're not yeah. going to give you a room. So that, I mean, this is what, it was very, very contested. I just want to, I mean, I stop in 1860, except for, you know, talking about Senator Ruby a little bit. Uh, there's so much more. And Bob was beginning to talk about this. I was completely fascinated. What happens after? I want to know about Bishop Healy. I'm fascinated. Yeah, yeah. Bishop, Bishop Healy here and Fire Chief Ruby over there. And, yeah. you know, I mean, that's, that's interesting. There's, but so it's, there's just, it, Maine definitely stands out, but I don't, I don't fully understand it. And I, what I'm interested in, and I'm telling you what I hope other historians will do, Mary will do, Bob will do, is I want to know the, the family social history. I want to know the business history, because my suspicion is that people like Manuel and the other businessmen there, that they were all tied into trading networks up and down the East Coast. That might be why Arthur, Arthur Tappan, the great abolitionist, was also a very major businessman. So a lot of the black men in New England port towns were very successful merchants. They were import export merchants often. They were caterers, they were restaurateurs. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know a little bit about this, but nowhere near. And that's where a lot of the women would come in. And I, Pam, you know, Pam, I believe you were mentioning, I mean, the women are not invisible. If I were gonna, if I had a PhD student, I would say, get the newspapers, get the Portland Advertiser and start looking at the ads in the teens and 20s and 30s and 40s of the 19th century, because I think you're gonna see ads for um, black women running, running businesses. But I'm, that's a guess on my part, but I think mm -hmm. there's a huge piece of history to be done there about family, social and women's history that I haven't done at all. So, so what, I, what I would just like to interject uh, right here is that, um, so black men held the power yeah. because they had the money, but make no mistake about it. The black women were powerful. They just didn't hold the power. It was the black men that held the power because they had the money and they had 
the jobs that created that that money. One of the things that you find that I find very interesting during this period that we're talking is that a lot of the black men had several jobs that they could do. Right. Uh, waiters was a great job. You could you were a waiter on land and, and you could go to the go to sea aboard a ship and be a, a steward. Mm -hmm. Same job. Yes. Same thing was true with all cook. Uh, even Christopher Christian Manuel had a catering business. That, although he was a barber, that was that's the big thing he's known for. But every so often you'll see them with cook. William Wilberforce Ruby uh, was a cook. Hmm. Uh, and uh, actually, he was a baker more than a cook. Hmm. But George Thompson Ruby was a confectioner. That was his first job that you find him in 1860 in Bangor as a confectioner. So they, they, <laughs> they knew how to, how to live, how, how to make sure that they, they made it through tomorrow and next week. And, 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 I, and I would also like to speak to um, just, just the ministers that came into the Abyssinian meeting house who, um, you know, many may or may not know, were all educated at the Oneida Institute. Um, they, they were um, trained strong writers. Um, they had, who, as I said, in their, their group, their circle of friends were all from around the country. So we're not just talking about, um, at, you know, we're, 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 we're more specifically, we're talking about people that were um, really not just, people may have thought that, oh, all that they can do is run a run run a you know be in it be on a be in the ships or be work in the ship industry in the shipping industry or they could do this or they could these were globally minded highly educated not necessarily educated highly intellectual people so they succeeded in many areas of their life and and that's what really a lot of people don't know so and what makes their power base so great is that at the Abyssinian, for example, they had a network and they would send Freeman here uh, to be the minister of, of the Abyssinian church. And he would leave here and they would send another from say Connecticut, another one of these educated men from this Oneida Institute, which it, you, that's a great place to look because they, they trained a lot of these black men there. So again, these, these are globally minded people mm -hmm. who are well aware of situations and, and they, they, they're successful on many different levels, many different levels. There are a couple of people in the audience that are asking about centers of black political power in Maine outside of Portland, like perhaps other cities like Bangor, um, were, did those social networks extend into Northern and Eastern Maine? Can any of you speak to this topic outside of Portland? Uh, I'll start off a little bit. Uh, I, you know, I'm here in Orono at the University of Maine, so and I live in Bangor, so I'm really interested in um, developing this story. And there's a wonderful book by Maureen Elders, Eldersman Lee, that's her name, Black Bangor, that talks more about the 20th century in uh, Bangor, but you know has includes some discussion of the 19th century. Well, well. I'll, not to interrupt you, Mary, but I'll put a link to that. We had that book is available through Maine Historical Society, so I'll put a link to that in the it's chat. Probably on my shelf back here somewhere, <laughs> but I don't know if I can dig it out right now. Um, but I, personally, I that's really a thread that I'm interested in pulling since I'm, you know, located up here and there is still this, you know, to even through today, there's the sort of two mains divide between, you know, Southern Maine located around Portland and 
uh, up here, although Bangor, you know, talk to somebody up in Arista County and I don't think that they would say Bangor is particularly far north. Um, but I mean, I, I think there there is a story to be uh, unfolded there and it just hasn't been um, told yet to that extent that I would love to see it told. And that's something um, I hope to see happen in the future. Although there are family histories and individuals whose lives have been um, talked about a little bit. I'll mention one person who I've been interested in, uh, Abraham Hansen, who there's a wonderful oil portrait of him by Jeremiah Pearson Hardy, uh, who probably is a familiar name to at least some of you out there. And it's one of the few 19th century oil portraits of an African-American person, man, uh, that is, you know, that is named, you know, the name of the individual subject. And um, so I've done a little bit of research about him. He was a barber in Bangor. And as probably my fellow panelists know, if someone's a barber, that's kind of a red flag for uh, being involved in politics. And I have found references to him talking about uh, Greek independence in the 19th century. I haven't found anything about abolition, but that suggests to me, of course, that he's politically engaged and uh, like Pam was saying, is tapped into this much broader cosmopolitan uh, world. So that's just to say, you know, there are threads that I think researchers can pull to find out more. Uh, Portland, I think, you know, population wise, much like today, it's has a, a large concentration just of people, uh, but that doesn't mean that there's not more to be discovered out there. There's one clear prominent leader from, uh, I'm almost certain it's Bangor, John T. Carter. That's the person who, uh, when Ruby and General Fessenden, um, this you know Federalist Whig and, and top abolitionist all at the same time. They try to swing the Portland Black, the, well, Maine, but Portland Black electorate over to the Liberty Party in 1841. And the Black Whigs basically, you know, they may admire General Fessenden, Reuben Ruby may have been their leader. They just won't do it. They're going to stick with the Whig Party, which Whigs all over the Northeast use as an example of why real anti slavery men remain Whigs, what the Black Whigs of Portland did. And it's Abram Niles who had inherited Ruby's position as the Whig, Black Whig leader the tithing man job, city government, the committee man and his ward and all that. And John T. Carter of, and I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, I, I believe it's Bangor. I'd have to check. It's either Bangor or Augusta. So he's a, he's, he is actually a notable leader. Um, there are two prominent, Hall I believe one is Hallowell, that are not political leaders, but I mentioned in my book just because they're an indication of the respect. One is a, a Seventh-day Adventist theologian named, if memory serves, Foy and like widely published. There is a certain tradition in upper New England of black men as respected theologians. Lemuel Haynes from Vermont is internationally famous actually as an Orthodox Congregationalist, but that's Vermont, but he's, he's a major figure. Um, so Foy is a really, I mean, even, I think I gather, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. If, I, if you were, he's still read today. And then there's an inventor, um, Robert Lewis, who is again celebrated, you know, sort of look at he invents um he uses oakum this the cast off from rope and i think he invents a hair oil but he gets several patents and these are prominent black mainers not from portland but they're not politically active the point that I, the other point to make though and from my perspective is that all of upper new england in the small towns and this is what is so completely at least to me foreign okay the small towns across upper new england almost all of them have at least a few black men from prominent, mainly revolutionary war veterans who had gotten their bounty, their land bounty. So, and this is true in Pennsylvania where I grew up. There were probably far more, you were probably much more likely to find a black man, a black family, a couple of black families in small town rural Maine 200 years ago than you would now. And this mm. was true in upstate New York and Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire because they spread out and they, in some cases, I don't know. I don't know what words to use. They assimilate. They, they, black men marry white women. They have children. They get elected to school committees. Eventually, you know, I haven't. You'd have to go into the later 19th and 20th century. Then the question is, why are there so? You know, at a certain point, why why aren't they there anymore? 
And that may be the history of the Klan in the 1920s, I'm guessing, I don't know. Or it's that there are better jobs, they take industrial jobs um, and go somewhere else. But that's a whole other history. But it is worth noting that, and this isn't, I'm not the one who's done this history, the, that, um, I'm blanking on the name, but the great compendium volume of black, black main history that I used showed that there were black men as the census shows, even on some of the small islands. I was just in North Haven a few weeks ago in North Haven. And I was looking at pictures from the middle of the 19th century or maybe late 19th century of sailing men, lobster men. And I was like, wait a minute, that's a pretty clear picture. That's a man of color right in there among the other lobster men. What's he doing there? So there's a huge, there's a history. Anyway, just want, I just wanted to throw that in. Well, 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 black men, that, that was one of, the, one of the premier jobs that they were allowed to do would ah. be uh, the mariner in industry. So okay. you would definitely find black men doing that. As a matter of fact, that's how they were able to smuggle slaves and get them up and down the coast by working in the boats. They, they knew you know, where to hide them on the boat, stow them away so that they could bring them to freedom, which ultimately their goal was Canada. So you, you would definitely see black men um, doing, and, and they were around then. So, you know, that's not uncommon. They were, that's one of the areas they were allowed and flourished in, in that capacity financially. We're coming almost to the, the end of our, our time for the panel, but this is, I mean, this has really been such a, an interesting and informative discussion. Um, and the audience is, is asking a lot of great questions. Um, and it, unfortunately, we, we're not gonna get to them all live. I'm going to put my email address into the chat box. Um, so if you have like a, a burning question or, or maybe a question that was just a little, a little too long for us to, to address in a live program, please don't hesitate to email me at uh, knewman at mainhistory.org and I'm happy to forward uh, your question onto our panelists um, so that maybe we can continue the discussion uh, even beyond this evening. If you're interested uh, in purchasing a copy of Van's book, uh, The First Reconstruction, as well as a lot of other um, great resources on Maine history, visit our online store, mainhistorystore.com. You can also visit our store and our museum and our research library in person at our Congress Street location, 489 Congress Street in Portland. Visit our website, mainhistory.org to learn more about our hours. If you wanna visit the museum, if you would like to see our new exhibit begin again, Reckoning with Intolerance in Maine, to learn more about a lot of the history and themes that were discussed this evening, you can learn more about our hours and how to purchase tickets on our website. You can also see virtual versions of that exhibit on our website as well and learn more about other virtual uh, programs in our Begin Again series. I want to uh, thank our panelists again so much for sharing your time and all of your great expertise with us this evening. And I also want to give each of our panelists a chance if there's anything else um, that you'd like to say or add before we close, uh, please go right ahead. Uh, I'll just, I saw one question that relates to the previous question. I'll mentioned that um, someone mentioned Addisville near Machias. And there's also a wonderful book about that by uh, Marcus Labrizi, who's a professor at UMaine Machias. Um, and so that's another, another uh, you know, kind of thread of talking about uh, Black people and Black politics outside of Portland that if you're interested is great. And I also wanted to mention we're also national minded, but uh, right down the road is New Brunswick. And um, of course, a really major community of black loyalists who ended up, you know, after the revolution settled in New Brunswick. So that's another kind of international border connection that I think shapes Maine's history in a way that we don't have time to go into tonight. But um, for those who are interested is, a, is another you know, something that I think makes Maine a little bit, look a little different than some of the other states, even in New England. 
And otherwise, just thanks to everybody for such a great discussion. Thank you yeah. very much. And, and I would also, a um, couple of things. I, I What I really want to be able to do was, is publicly thank um, so many people in this community that um, have, have made it known that they support the work that the Abyssinian is doing. Um, I thank God for, for you know, touching the hearts of so many people to all open up and finally understand this is an incredible piece of Maine's history. Through this project, through this building, there will be a lot of questions that are answered, a lot of history that's been left out of the books that need to be put into books so that we can all understand who we are and where we're coming from. And, and, and on here, I've seen, you know, you've talked about Carter and there was one other name and you had people who chimed in and said, oh, those are relatives of mine. You wow. saw a lot of, once you, once you find out, once we start delving into some of this history, you know, a, a lot comes out of it. So first and foremost, I really wanted to thank everybody for understanding that when we do say Black Lives Matter, the Abyssinian really is the beginning of that because mm -hmm. those Black people's lives do matter in the history of the state of Maine. So thank you everybody who is supporting us in the work that we are doing. Um, and I, I thank you, the Maine Historic Society for bringing these, these um, conversations to light and to public and to help us to understand better and to help us live and make Maine a better state. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me as well.